I'm Morgan Peckma, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today, our guest is City and State columnist Seth Barron. Seth, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Morgan. It's always a pleasure. So were you surprised by the lack of surprises last night in the city council races? I was as unsurprised as everybody. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, there was very little going on that um, in, the, in the council races generally that was, you know, of very much interest for the general election and nothing really happened. Were there any races that you felt were in doubt? Um, yeah, there were a few. The Dennis Safran, Paul Vallone race in District 19 up in um, Northeast Queens, you know, that, that, could have, that could have gone either way. I mean, as it turned out, Paul Vallone, you know, had a lot of support and obviously his family name didn't hurt uh, and he won. The uh, race between Eric Ulrich and Lou Simon um, down in the Rockaways. You know, that was surprisingly close. It actually was fairly close. Um, and, you know, Ulrich won. I mean, he's a popular guy. Lou Simon, you know, he, he didn't really seem like that compelling a candidate, but clearly he had some backers. Do you think that was a function of the kind of de Blasio coattails? I mean, we didn't hear a lot about that, but that seems to me that that might be the case. Yeah, probably. I mean, that would make sense. I mean, it, it seems, I, I was looking at it on the precinct level, the, the ED level, and it, it seemed like there was pretty strong turnout down there in the Democratic areas. And um, apparently, you know, the Simon's consultant had told me that he... His base is in, you know, sort of eats into Ulrich's area. So that could have had something to do with it, too. And uh, Steve Mateo on Staten Island had a big win, despite the fact that, uh, you know, Bill de Blasio had such a, an, an epic beatdown in the mayoral uh, race. Right. Well, you know, Staten Island, you know, the south and mid parts of Staten Island are very Republican. And even, I think even if people were going with the, you know, they split the ticket basically. I think that they're very comfortable having their Republicans, uh, well, you know, council members down there. So looking at the council uh, over the next months before the session starts, I mean, what are you going to be, to be watching? Uh, well, clearly the lineup for the speaker race is going to be of great interest. Um, you know, how that shakes out is, is really the, the, the one question that remains. Uh, for what the city, how, what the city's governance is going to be for the next four years, that and you know how the committee memberships work out, um, you know also there's interesting legislation on the uh, on the table coming up. Um, you know, per I personally find this question of non-citizen voting very, uh, very, very interesting, and yeah. that's, that's supposed to come up in the next six months. Well, that w that was the topic of your last column, and I'm surprised that by the fact that. You're the only person I've seen write about this issue because it seems very, it's, a, it's an extraordinary shift. Can you talk about what uh, is at play with non-citizen voting? Certainly. Um, there's a bill that's been sponsored by Danny Drum, uh, who's from Jackson Heights. Uh, he's chair of the Immigration Committee, and he's a very, very vocal advocate on you know, for immigrants. Um, he has put forth a bill, Intro 410, which would allow non-citizen resident voters of New York City to vote in local elections. So that, that excludes, you know, illegal aliens or undocumented uh, people. Um, but it includes anyone who he is here on legally, except for tourists. Uh, so if you're a student with a student visa, if you have a green card, if you have a U visa or a J or, a, you know, an H-1B visa, then you would be eligible to vote in municipal elections. Municipal elections include city council, borough president, mayor, public advocate, controller, um, but not, uh, not you know, um, state or federal elections, which are, uh, you know, governed by other laws. So it's, it's very, it's striking that, as, I mean, as you said, student visas, someone who's just here for six months or a year could be able to <coughs> vote in elections. Does that diminish uh, kind of the, some of the fundamental benefits of citizenship in your mind? Well, I mean, it seems like there aren't that many, you know, privileges that, are, that go along with being a citizen except for voting. So, yeah, I would say so. I mean, it seems odd to me. Um, I mean, one thing that I thought was interesting about the response to my column was it, that it did get a lot of attention, but only from advocates, uh, people who are pro the bill. I mean, maybe this bill is just so generally popular that no one's against it. 
Are, are there any other places uh, in the country that have non-citizen voting? Not of any significance. They're, they're, the advocates keep talking about there are six towns in Maryland that currently allow it. Um, they're all tiny little jurisdictions within Montgomery County. Um, one of them has 180 people total. Uh, so I don't know how many votes that is, and I don't think they have any non-citizen votes. It's kind of just a, I mean, these are the same kind of little jurisdictions that are, um, there are more people on this floor than there are in that uh, town. More or less. And some of these jurisdictions also ban, you know, the transport of nuclear weapons through their communities. So it, it's that type of thing. It's, it's really more of a symbolic gesture. Um, so really, there's, n there's, n there's nowhere anywhere near the size of New York uh, doing this currently. We've heard a lot of uh, horror stories about how the Board of Elections uh, runs our, our elections. Um, how would this be implemented from a practical standpoint? <clears throat> That's a great question, and it's one that hasn't really been answered sufficiently. Um, the voters would not be, uh, the, the non-citizen voters could not be identified at the polling place in any visible way. So they would have to be incorporated into the same voting lines, the same tables, the same machines. Um, essentially, I think the idea is that they would be given a separate ballot to fill out. Um, now, you know, when you go to vote, you're given a ballot and it's numbered. You know, so there's supposed to be some order to it. Frankly, it seems like an extremely complicated system and I don't know how it would work. And um, the, the non-citizen voters can't be separated from the other voters so that they're not stigmatized as being non-citizens? Presumably. Uh, I guess that's the idea. Right. Um, so there's not supposed to be any identification of them except that there would be an M next to their names in the voter lists, which also have to be consolidated. Um, you know, we're talking about millions of entries uh, and people's immigration status, people's visa status, they're all, it's always changing. Oh, you hear about someone who has a student visa and then, oh, they're not in school anymore, so what's their status? Someone has a a work visa and then their employer changed, you know. There's all kinds of potential confusions that really seem like it could throw a pretty clunky system into total chaos. And when we go to vote, I mean, it's pretty much just on the honor system, right? Oh, it's <coughs> like, here's my name, it's in the book, and I sign my name, and as long as the signatures match up, then I'm allowed to vote, right? How would we establish uh, whether a person is uh, a, a valid uh, resident uh, so that they could be a, a non-citizen voter? When you register to vote, uh, even today, when you register to vote, you basically affirm that you're allowed to vote. Uh, so essentially now anybody can sign up to vote. And there's no checks. Nobody checks. Uh, the Board of Elections doesn't check. Campaign Finance Board doesn't check. Um, it's just your word. Now the, you know, the downside is that if you at some point uh, apply for citizenship, you then, have to, you then have to swear that you've never voted. Of course, you know, you could also, if you lied on one, you could lie on the other. Um, there's basically very little checking going on as it is. So, you know, essentially it could happen now. Uh, the thing about voter fraud is that everyone says it doesn't happen, but no one's looking. So it's hard to say one way or the other. With Bill de Blasio scoring over 70% of the vote, I mean, these are increasingly dark days for the New York City Republican Party. And um, though there are some immigrant populations that tend to vote heavily Republican, like the Russian community, uh, for the most part, the immigrant community is uh, inclined toward the Democratic Party. If non-citizen voting were allowed to take place, would that just further banish the Republican Party into uh, obsolescence? I think that's absolutely true. I, I don't think you would ever see a Republican uh, winning on the citywide level again. Um, I mean, I don't even know if we'll, we'll see one winning on the citywide level again anyway. But, you know, for instance, Eric Ulrich, he's the only Republican not on Staten Island in the city council, you know, come January. Uh, given the close margin in his, in his recent victory, his, you know, yesterday's victory, and looking at his district, which has sizable immigrant populations, there's a lot of Hispanic and South Asians down there, um, I don't think he would have won. 
Uh, so absolutely, it would have, you know, it would, it would, I think it would definitely solidify New York as a one-party state. In your article, you say that um, there is a, a majority of the council has signed on to this legislation as sponsors, and at least according to Councilmember Drum, it seems like there might even be a veto-proof majority in order for this to pass. <coughs> is there any opposition to the bill mounting? There's some opposition um, among the Republicans. Uh, they're against it. Um, and, uh, you know, a few council members who had signed on as co-sponsors took their names off it. Uh, Debbie Rose and Karen Kozlowitz were co-sponsors who removed their names from it around the time uh, of the, the bill's hearing back in May. Um, Karen Kozlowitz stuck comment as to why she did that. Debbie Rose spoke to the Staten Island Advance and said basically that she didn't like the way the bill was written and that we needed a more comprehensive uh, solution to the problem of immigrants and so forth, which, you know, to my ear was basically, um, you know, perhaps Debbie Rose realizing that we're non-citizen voting to go through, it, it would really complicate the calculus, the electoral calculus of her district. Um, not necessarily in a way that would favor her. Uh, the North Shore of, of Staten Island has a, a very large immigrant population. I think there's 31,000 people there who would be eligible to vote. Um, who's to say that they're gonna vote for her? Uh, there's a lot of Sri Lankans, there's a lot of Mexicans, there's a lot of Latin Americans you know, of all stripes. Um, it's a really fascinating question if you look at some of these districts, they have, some of these districts in the city have more non-citizens in them than citizens. Um, out in Queens, where Julissa Ferreras and Danny Drum are, 60 percent, 70 percent of the district could be non-citizen. And when you count illegal immigrants, nobody really knows. I mean, everyone agrees that the census undercounted Queens. Um, so it's really hard to say. The, the, the implications of this bill, to me, are just staggering. Um, but it seems to be flying under the radar. And yeah, apparently the incoming council appear to be behind it. Um, I don't know what the mayor, the new mayor will say about it. De Blasio has kind of said he needs to look at it. I can't imagine he would veto something so popular in the council. So this could be the next, the next step in New York City politics, which is basically open free voting to everyone. And, and the majority of council districts are represented by a person who is of the, the dominant ethnic group. Is that correct? <clears throat> that is correct. Uh, there are a few cases where a minority council member represents a uh, majority other uh, district. For instance, Rosie Mendez is a is of Puerto Rican descent. Um, her district is actually majority white. Um, Danny Drum represents a, a mixed district. Uh, it's about forty percent Latino, forty percent Asian, twenty percent white. That's you know rough. There are there are some other people in there. Like there's there are black residents, but so in that case, there's no dominant ethnicity. And, you know, I think I, I spoke to Councilmember Drum about this. I said, well, if, if all these new people get to vote, why do you assume they're going to vote for you? He would have 60,000 new voters in his district. Um, and he sort of hemmed and hawed about it and said, well, you know, there's a lot of, there's different kinds of diversity. There's diversity within diversity. But really, I think what he was getting at was that it's not so bad to be the dominant minority sometimes. Uh, if you can, pl I mean, for, for instance, here's an assembly race up in the Bronx. Um, Mark Joni took over from Naomi Rivera. Now, Naomi Rivera was a special case, but here's a district that's about 40% black, 40% Latino, and it was assumed that it would have to have a black, uh, like a, basically a Latino member. Um, Joni, who's of Albanian descent, essentially split the minority vote and won the black vote, you know, with a very sizable, sizable numbers. So all I'm saying is that these things get very complicated when you break them down. 
and that in a pluralistically divided city, it's it's hard to say who's necessarily going to come out on top. Being that uh, legislation in New York City oftentimes pollinates the rest of the country, I'm sure that this will grow in terms of visibility as a bill kind of comes closer to fruition and I'm sure it'll be a very incendiary issue for conservatives. Uh, Seth Barron, thank you so much for bringing our attention to this uh, very interesting piece of legislation. Thanks, Morgan. And that's it for this episode of Last Look. For more episodes, please join us on the web at cityandstateny.com.